Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today we're going to be talking about five more board games that left the Side Game library and five to replace them. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for the continuous support. Let's talk about five more board games that left the Side Game library. We're going to start off with Viscounts of the West Kingdom. This is a game where you're going to be playing cards in a deck building fashion in front of you into this conveyor belt. The cards are going to either give you abilities when you play them, when they're discarded off that conveyor belt, or while they're active in front of you. You'll use the card to move around the board, use its symbols to take actions, and then accrue points in a variety of ways, whether it be gaining these deeds, or it's going to be gaining manuscripts, fighting in the central castle area, or building buildings around the board. Now the reason that this is going to be leaving the library is for the fact that I think that the game itself is slow and honestly a little generic and boring. It's not that interesting interesting, and the deck building itself is quite delayed. It's going to take a long time for certain cards to be moving around your board. There are ways to move things around a bit faster, but the game is very procedural, and honestly, the scoring potential itself is not that interesting or exciting. You have some simple set collection, and then you have a very fiddly knight attacking system in the center, where you're trying to get several knights in the same positions to move them around, and the resolution of that can take a while and is frankly not that interesting. In addition, most most of these paths are a little unbalanced with the central knight scoring being the strongest for sure, where the expansion had to bolster some of the other aspects just to make them a bit more competitive, and that definitely added a lot more complexity to the game while not making it that much more smooth or interesting in general. So that's why Viscounts is leaving the library, and my recommendation to replace it is actually going to be Great Western Trail. Now I'm going to be talking about the Argentina version of the game, as it's just recently released, and I'm loving it. Uh, it's definitely up there with me, sitting at around an 8 or 9 on the rating scale, and Great Western Trail Argentina has a very similar mechanism, where on your turn you get to determine how far you want to go, and based on where you land, then you can use the cards in your hand to utilize the action spaces that you're entering. So you're going to be traveling the Great Western Trail, and every time you stop, you're able to interact with the board. And that's one thing I really enjoy over something like Viscounts, where the actions are coming from the spaces, and so everything you're doing is varied, but there are also many options and abilities that you can use and utilize and are encouraged to. Particularly in Argentina, you have four different essentially tracks that you're able to pick up and these are in the form of people that are working for you or helping you out. They're going to give you access to different abilities, bolster the strength of different actions, but you can still benefit from using all of those actions so you're not narrowed down to one specific road without forfeiting the entire game. There's this cool delivery system as well in the game where you're going to try to manage not only your deliveries in the moment but maximizing how you can use the deliveries after they've happened. So there's some cool thought and planning at every single step of the road. I love the varied strategies. I love the way that you are assigning abilities to the cards in your deck uh, based on the buildings that you're able to build. A lot to love in Great Western Trail Argentina, and I think that this new edition offers even more um, than the original, and it's one that I think I'll be coming back to more than the original. So that's Great Western Trail Argentina, incredible replacement for Viscounts of the West Kingdom. The next game that's leaving the library is Pandemic Fall of Rome. Uh, I do want to be straightforward with you. All of these games already have left the library actually so they're already sold off and these new ones have been being played quite a bit more but pandemic fall of rome here is a reskin of pandemic and this one you are going to be playing as a commander in the roman empire and the instead of infection cubes that are going to be attacking you they're going to be barbarians and these barbarians are going to be coming on specific lines so it's a bit more of a feeling like something like tower defense where they're going to follow these specific invasion paths they're going to be coming down here and it's up to you to send your characters around the map, but you'll be commanding these Roman legions. So you'll take them out and you'll be able to attack using these combat dice. I actually really enjoy the combat system in this game. There's special abilities on your combat dice that trigger your uh, general special effect. So I love that some characters maybe have negative effects on theirs if they're not really a fighter, or you have some characters that really want to be in battle so they can try to roll that symbol as much as possible. And the trickling in of the cubes is also interesting, but overall, this feels like a strange mix up of the pandemic formula into this battle system. Them, but it does work. Uh, that being said, when Pandemic gets picked, usually it's not going to be Fall of Rome. It's usually going to be Pandemic Iberia or just the original Pandemic. Um, the theming is a little odd here, and I think that the other Pandemic games are stronger, which is why this one ended up leaving. So for my replacement for this one, I am going to recommend that you play Pandemic Iberia. 
Pandemic Iberia if you want that pandemic experience. But if you're looking for a game that's similar to this one in particular, I'm actually going to recommend Dawn of the Zeds. This has a bit more of that tower defense feeling, and I think that the cinematic and storytelling presence of this game is strong. In Dawn of the Zeds, you play as a group of characters inside of a town that are repelling a variety of zombies. There's going to be outbreaks and riots that you're going to try to quell, and you'll have zombies that sometimes have super effects and abilities, but every turn feels like a terrifying experience or a windfall of positive and negative events. So you'll be drawing a card every turn, and that card is going to do something that affects the map, and then you deal with the consequences. This is very much a game of attrition, where you're trying to stay alive as much as possible, uh, manage how much damage you're taking and how much uh, damage the enemies are taking and you'll be whittling down each other sending a bunch of people to the hospital and trying to just reduce the amount of damage and make it to the end of the game where eventually the u.s military is going to be able to come in and save the day i love the tension in this game the thematics of it and how much of an uphill battle it is throughout it has the tense moments that you know are coming and the impending doom but having options and ways to fight back it's a unique experience that is a different take on the zombie genre, but it has that same sort of tower defense paths that the uh, pandemic fall of Rome has with its barbarian hordes. I like this one. I love the thematics on it. That is, Z uh, what is this called? <laughs> this is Dawn of the Zeds replacing pandemic fall of Rome. Next up is a cooperative game called The Faceless. And this is a game where you're going to be playing as a group of children who've gone to basically the upside down from Stranger Things. And you're going to be using these action cards to move a central compass. And this compass is going to be drawn to the different magnets on the board. So this is probably the best picture I could find here that actually shows what the game looks like in full uh, function. You have these silver tokens in the center here that you're trying to get your compass to land on. And when you land on it, you claim it, and that gives you a special ability every turn. Uh, not every turn, once per game. And the enemy that you're going to be fighting against, though, is this Billy Goat, and he is going to be coming towards you every so often, trying to attack you as well. So your goal is to try to use your action cards to maneuver around and collect all of these tokens and then have them all before the billy goat eventually gets to you now this game seems very cool in theory but in practice to me it's not that exciting it feels like a simple basic cooperative game you might find at something like target that has the cool gimmick of the compass and to me that's what this game leans into a lot is that gimmick and for what it's worth it works but the action card system is not that exciting to me you have a recursion mechanism that's going to be getting those cards back into your hand and that's really where the focus of the game is to me because playing the cards uh, is pretty straightforward with how of uh, the magnets are going to work because you can clearly see what direction that those are going to be pulling so for me not that exciting of an actual game and mechanisms that feel very uh, mass marketing honestly when it comes to like a basic cooperative game uh, so not one that i ever pulled out unfortunately the theming is cool the, the idea of using the magnets is cool but i'd rather see it in a game that's a bit more compelling or interesting that being said if you're looking for something similar where you have one central character and everybody is sort of influencing or controlling that character in this case it's the compass my recommendation to replace this game is going to be solomon kane solomon kane has you playing as a virtue of some sort and on your turn you have the options during the actual gameplay where you're able to interact on the map you can summon your virtue onto the board and you can use this virtue to influence the surroundings of Solomon Kane himself so Solomon Kane is a character that's in the world that you don't actually control but you can influence you can use your abilities and effects to allow him to move to push around to attack to fight or you can use yourself as sort of a barrier or a wall for the different shadows and enemies that are coming to attack Solomon so there's some cool options that you are playing as this sort of spectral being that you can influence the game as, um, but you're not tied to a a mechanism that's just having you repeat the same actions. Uh, every turn you have, a, as a virtue, have the option to play these special cards on the left and right side of your board, but you're also able to interact with each other, combo each other, and even share dice with each other. So there's a lot of communication and cooperation, which I appreciate in a cooperative game where you actually are encouraged to cooperate and to give resources to one another and share with one another, and it's something that's constantly happening. The game system itself is a simple dice placement game where you're using those um, dice 
to take the actions, but I think the overall product of it is well done, and I think the story structure is wonderful. The strongest part of this game is definitely the storytelling itself. Each scenario is going to be taking the writings from the original Solomon Kane novels and putting you into that scenario. The gameplay is simplified so that the story takes the forefront, and Solomon Kane does a great job of delivering that while also encouraging cooperation. So that is The Faceless being replaced by Solomon Kane. Up next is the original Dune. This is the 2019 reprint of the original Dune but from Gale Force 9, and this has you playing one of the factions from the Dune universe. You're going to be fighting over Arrakis, trying to gain spice to deploy your different soldiers, and the goal of the game is to control three of the fortresses. You can also align in order to gain four of them between the two of you, and you'll be doing this through the use of a battle wheel, using different items, your leaders, your effects, there are traitors in the game, and the asymmetry in this game is awesome because it actually permeates the entire experience. It's not just an ability that you have, but it's going to be an effect that affects maybe an entire phase of the game. One cool example of this is the Emperor has this ability where they're going to get all the money that's spent during the auction phase, and that's awesome because you're going to try to want to drive up those prices so that you're going to get more money off the other players and then use that in turn to be able to summon all sorts of characters to the map. If you control the spice, you control the universe, so you obviously you're going to want to try to get a lot of that. So Dune itself is a cool system, but for me, the reason that this is leaving the library is the uniformity of the experiences, how similar the games actually feel from game to game, which is wild to think about because of the asymmetry. In this game, your character arc, your your progression of your journey as you play feels so similar. You have a slow trickle out of items, you are putting characters onto the map, you fight for these regions, and you are usually depleting the entire uh, section of fighters down to maybe one or two characters, and this sort of repeats the entire game. For me, this experience is something that Despite the different asymmetry and the effects, every single battle, every single experience, every single gameplay feels the same, seems to play by the same numbers, despite having all of these variable pieces that make up the game. Most of the items do similar things. Most of the characters are going towards that same end goal. There's no real branching strategies from those different characters, which I found sort of wild and you'd have to play it yourself to figure this out it might be different for you maybe it's maybe the different game groups have all a similar play styles but i don't think so i played with four or five different game groups on this one and for me it's not one that i think is going to be long lasting uh, for the replacements for this game i do want to recommend dune imperium if you're looking for a dune theme but if you're looking for a game that has a similar vibe and play style i'm going to recommend rising sun so rising sun in particular has you playing something similar where you're sending out troops onto a board, using those troops in order to attack different areas, but the focus is on those fights. The focus is on building up towards this epic war phase, and then when the war phase finally happens, you're using your troops to participate in combats. You have this sort of blind bidding mechanism where you're going to be wagering on advantages, and then based on those advantages, you're going to be sharing currency around and influencing the other battles. And so this is something to be aware of not only through the entire portion of the game where you're not fighting, but each fight matters and the order of those fights matters in, in addition. Uh, one cool thing that this also does to help out with the variability and the change are not only do you have asymmetric powers, which definitely are not going to be as big and as uh, game-changing as the ones in Dune, but in Rising Sun, not only do you have the asymmetric powers, but you also have sets of these season cards. And these are cards that you can purchase throughout the game during train actions, and these are going to give you special powers, abilities, and even creatures that are going to fight on your side. By sh uh, switching in and out the season card sets, you're going to make it so that the game is wildly different each time you play. And in each season set, there are varied options that you can go through and choose and follow. So you're not stuck on one specific play style. And it's almost a guarantee that each game you play is going to have a huge different aspect to it. You have some that really lay into getting the abilities of the gods that are present in the map. You have some that are going to focus on using the different strongholds and scoring. Some that are more monster centric some that are about the honor i love the way that the season cards change the game and it's some of my favorite mini expansions that you can get for this game are those season cards just a brand new set of abilities and powers i love the way that you can integrate them here so that is rising sun replacing dune and if you're looking really for a dune theme i also recommend dune imperium and that brings us to our last game here. This is a smaller roll and write game. This is Super Skill Pinball 4K. Now this one here is a 
pinball simulation experience. You're going to be rolling dice and you're shooting the ball up at the top. You'll choose that top layer, use one of the dice to mark a box, and then you'll roll again and you'll just kind of go down your board. So each time you go, you're trying to maximize your point value, going down, eventually hitting these flippers, and then those flippers will shoot you back up. And so you'll go down, up, down, up, hit bumpers potentially to give you other abilities. And then every time you score points, you're going to mark them on this separate sheet on the side here on the top, the back glass. So um, the biggest thing that Super Scope Pinball is for me is it's an exercise in the correct decision. In this game, in my opinion, it does not feel like you're ever really making any incredible choices. There are even moments in the game, particularly on these maps with things that have prominent bumpers, where every single time you roll something, you're going to be chalking off a box and moving back and forth through these little bumper systems. And to me, it is a little more mind-numbing than it is exciting. You get the number, you move to the next one, you chalk the number. There's no real... It's missing that satisfaction bonus of bonuses and chaining actions because you're not actually chaining actions. You're just going through a cycle until you eventually don't hit a die roll that works. So the dice are determining where you're writing as opposed to you determining where you're going to be writing the results of these different dice. So I think that's the difference here where the game is dictating where you are playing things as opposed to where you are wanting to play things yourself from the various options the game can give you. It's a lot of repetition and going with the obvious choice and not a lot of customization and choice and player-driven decision. So I think that losing that agency in this game is super annoying. And I think just the, the way that it feels when you are just marking a box to mark a box it is not satisfying at all. I feel like this game is playing me and I'm not playing it. That being said, there are a couple of maps in here, particularly the dragon one, as well as the casino one in the second one that do give you a bit more agency. But I think that overall, they are still missing that aspect of that constant, um, constant important choice that I think a good roll and write needs. And in order to replace this game, I do recommend Welcome 2. Uh, one of the features of the Super Scope Pinball 4K is that you have the same core game system, but a bunch of different maps for it. And each of the map has its own rules. Welcome to the Moon does the same thing, but it replaces the Super Scope Pinball system with the Welcome 2 system. A very simple system where you're going to be drawing these three cards and you're going to be picking the number from one of them. And then the other set of cards has another three and you're going to be picking the symbol for one of them. So Welcome 2 has a super simple simple core, uh, very similar to something like Super Scope Minball, but it's going to take those that core system and put it into more interesting games. And this Welcome to the Moon edition has several maps that you can play from, each with their own rules and regulations, just like the um, different boards for Super Scope Pinball. I think that the choices here are a lot more impactful. You're constantly making these dedications, these commitments based on where you're putting your different areas because you're going to be trying to complete mostly rows and columns, cutting them up based on the map you're playing. There'll be a lot to think about every time you play and those consequences are pretty crucial. And I think that's awesome. The fact that you actually have lasting impacts from the different things that you're playing. Now, I do prefer the original Welcome 2 to Welcome to the Moon. I think that one's a lot more streamlined with the way that they were adding additional rules in the expansions but if you are looking for a experience similar to super skill pinball then i do recommend welcome to the moon because it does have that same feature of offering a bunch of different boards in the same box with varied gameplay experiences built around a core system so that is my recommendation for replacing super skill pinball for Cade. that is welcome to the moon and that's it those are five more board games that left the side game library if you have any questions about any of these games that i talked about here please let me know down in the comments comments below. And for links to anything that I talked about, take a look in the description of the video. I'm curious to hear what you think about these games. For me, I find these calling videos hard to talk about sometimes because it's hard to wrap into words exactly why I dislike a game. And the reasons I dislike a game may totally be something you don't connect or understand with. And I'm curious what you think of these games I talked in particular. How do your games of Dune go? I've played at least 12 games, 13 games of the original Dune. So I'm curious to hear if you've had a similar experience. Does that arc still feel the same to you? And or does that asymmetry push it different? Or maybe it's the groups that I've been playing with. What do you think about Viscounts? I know that's some people's favorite game from the West Kingdom trilogy, but for me, it's one that I just could not get myself to enjoy. I tried so hard, waited for the expansion, and there was some things that I enjoyed, but overall, it 
was so lacking and I wish that it was more interesting and more engaging. So I'm pretty interested to hear what you think about these games in general. What do you think of my picks? What do you think of my choices for replacements? Thank you so much for watching Side Game Strong.